Hello again, Mr. Bill Shoup. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? It's been a little while. I'm I'm doing very well. You know, I can I am you can probably hear from the echoey uh house that I'm sitting in. I have still not sold my house. Still moving, still similar to where I was before, although not, you know, doing the exact same thing. I'm sitting in a different part of my house. This is my mantle. Or what would be my mantle if I had, you know, like a piece of thing here. Uh I did notice um, that actually. I, I I think every time we've recorded, you've sat in a different location. Whether it's the same house, different house. I think you've probably recorded from multiple houses at this point, and definitely different rooms within these houses. Yeah, yeah, probably. So I'm in the same room as the last time. Different angles from view. Okay. Uh, but you know, I I like to stay mobile, right? Transportation got to get moving, got to stay active and mobile. Uh, so I, I work from anywhere. I'm, I'm equal opportunity in that, you know, endeavor. You got to keep our podcast listener engaged, right? You got to got to keep them on their toes, right? The, the to one, surprise, all of where's the many pod, next time? The many podcast listeners we have from, from recording, what is this, four now? Three? This is four, yeah. And never actually posting a single one. So when they finally do get to hear this, know that if you're not watching the video version of this, you're missing out on about 40% of the content and the joy of of the whole deal. You're very optimistic using that they word. Uh, I'm still I'm, I'm still using the, the singular pronouns here. We still haven't figured out like what the name of this this thing is going to be. We do need to discuss that. Yeah, that we'll do that offline before we actually hit post. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I assume that. And then we'll just like splice it in and Presumably edit this part out of the conversation so that... No, just, why, no, why would okay. you edit? No, don't edit. Yeah, that's, yeah. That takes time and effort, it, it which I, I don't want to do. No, I, I, I certainly don't want to do it either. And, and yeah, I was thinking maybe adding to the mystique here, but there's really, there's no mystique, is there? Yeah. I get low budget is is both a lifestyle and a marketing play. <laughs> uh, so you know, like what you get is what you get. Uh, you were recently on vacation. I was. Yeah. That's why we didn't report last week. It was because Bill was, I, wasn't able to. I was too busy doing nothing. Well, re- really, I was probably chasing the kids around at the time. That yeah. We yeah. When talk. you, those of our listener base will say our, our dozens, I'm, I'm willing to say that we might have dozens of listeners. Yeah, very optimistic. <laughs> um, who don't have kids will, will not understand like going on vacation as a parent is not relaxing in any way, shape, or form. It is just like watching your kids in another place. That's yes. it. That's what you in, an, in an unfamiliar place where yeah. they have a lack of familiarity and and so none of your routines matter. So yeah. it's just, it's a free-for-all. It's, yes, it's it's chaos. Um, a lot of, um, I don't want to say a lot of yelling, but they're definitely an increased amount of scolding for sure. Yep, yep, yeah. Uh, we, that is the main reason why we, we only take one vacation a year when we're lucky. Uh, it is for a week and that's it. It is typically over the July 4th holiday. Uh, and we just like go and we, we bundle all of that stress into one really specific instance. I think that's wise. We, um, yep. so we were, we were at, uh, Lake Winnipesaukee, which is in, uh, New Hampshire. That is an actual place? It is an actual place. Lake Winnipesaukee. And I can spell it, I think, correctly. Please, please do. <laughs> spelling nope. spelling B, ready to go. All right, all right great. great. For our, our supply chain podcast, here we go. How to spell Lake Winnipesaukee. I won't spell the lake part. Um, L-A-K-E. W- here, boom, yeah. done. All right, thanks. Good job. Uh, W-I-N-N-I-P-E-S-A-U-K-E-E. Lake Winnipesaukee. Um, I would have expected a K in there, not a... Uh, it's it's not like K. I know, I know. Again, all the excitement here, right? Matt moving around, a K in the lake name. Um, you know, it, it relates to supply chain in that, like, physical location. Geography is extremely important in moving things. Not everything has to relate to supply chain, Matt. This does, though, okay? okay? So you're welcome. All right, fine. Thank you. And anyway, we've been going there for the past several years, so so that's kind of our method of of controlling the chaos is going to a place that's slightly more familiar to the children than just a new place every time. Interesting. Okay. 
were were lobster rolls consumed? Is this part of the Northie? I don't know where. I'm not familiar with Lake Winnipesaukee. So, so lakes, generally not right next to oceans, or else they just become part of the ocean. <clears throat> generally, okay. General, right. So and anyway, and New Hampshire. So New Hampshire mountains, right? So okay. um, yeah. Um, nonetheless, yes, we did eat lobster. Yeah, because <laughs> we're in New England. But I'm just Bill, yes. Bill, you want to know the, the weirdest place that I've ever eaten lobster? You're going to like this. Uh, Afghanistan, which is a land, both a landlocked country and a desert country. And yes, they did fly in lobster for us. So don't act all high and mighty like, oh, we were at a lake. It's inland. We definitely were eating lobster. You can get lobster anywhere. Okay. Right. You With win. The joys of yes. logistics. You win, yes, and and fair. We were in New England, therefore we were eating lobster. That is what we do here. Yeah, y'all do y'all do two things as far as my particular understanding cuisine wise, coming from the south, where we our two things are barbecue brisket and tacos. Yours, again, prove me wrong here, is lobster or lobster. Close. And close, all right, close. And uh, apple cider donuts. Mm. We did eat those too. And it's I made time clam- for those. And I made clam chowder. You forgot the New England clam chowder. Chowder. So you chowder. got three. Wow, I'm yeah. blown away. Yep. Well done, New England. You, you got us nailed. That is that is what we eat every day: lobster and cider donuts. I man. Uh, I it is so viewers when it listeners whoever whoever you are whenever you are what is important to know that is in this moment the pumpkin spice latte has been launched again by Starbucks it is officially fall season and so Bill is able to eat apple cider donuts to his heart's content and this is when I long to be kind of effectively switched places with Bill so that I may go eat apple cider donuts because I love them. Like, they are they are a little miracle of nature, yes. Um, yeah, without a doubt. Can, can they not, was, any, do they not exist what? in Texas? Do they not exist do in Texas? Do apples exist in Texas? We have apples. I know cider. apples, no, a cider donuts. It must be a little cider donut. We, it's not... We, you can get cider donuts the... the 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 best form of cider donuts that you can get in Texas come from a place you might be familiar with, uh, Trader Joe's. Heard of it? Yeah, they 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 make cider donuts, and you can procure them from them. And they are they're they they scratch an itch, but they do not like fill the void. For I I can see that. Yeah, the, yeah. We 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 buy from our local. We, we get. We've got a local apple orchard. We get it from there. Of course. Lake yes. Winnipesaukee. We went to our local farm stand. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I'm sure it's staff by wonderful human beings, little farm stand. I can only imagine how delicious it is. Um, we we do our our most close relation there is that there is a there's Bergdahl's pecans, which is a pecan orchard here in Texas, relatively nearby in the way that like everything in Texas is like like 45 minutes to an hour away from everything else um, and they make pump, uh, pecan pie and so that's sort of the closest analogy that we might have to that we'll, we'll make a trade sometime because pecan pie sounds awesome yeah. um, at, some, at some point we're going to be in the same place at the same time not over the internet potentially who knows maybe at a conference I don't know we'll see it depends on how much I get into anime in the next 12 months I guess Probably not going to happen, Matt. Sorry, I Bill. I'm going to let you know. There's a there is so much crossover between D and D and anime, like and and also supply chain. There's a lot of nerds in all of those realms. You might you might like it. I have some recommendations I could give you on the great think, fantasy anime. I, I begrudgingly agree that you're pro- almost certainly correct. I just haven't ventured there, but um, I know I know that I'm correct, specifically given how many people DM'd me. When I like put up that I worked at Crunchyroll, there were a lot of people were like, "Oh my gosh, I love anime!" I'm like, yeah, you're all nerds. I I get it. 
Yeah. And speaking of speaking of supply chain nerds, DM you and maybe maybe our listener wants to hear us talk about supply chain because I'm I'm assuming that our hey. on the podcast is going to be called something something supply chain or supply chain something something Bill, something. I, I love it. Let's call it that. <laughs> something something supply chain. That's there it is. <laughs> um. Now here now look we we had like a we we've done ten minutes of jibber jabber you know catching up. It's been so long since I've talked to you. So yeah, I'm down. I'm down for that. We can get into supply chain topics. You had one that you wanted to ask me about, so now I will humbly ask you to ask me the thing right. you wanted. Right. We've already discussed this, but for the sake of our listener, um, yeah. So there was something that happened with Pitney Bowes, and yes. and everybody started talking about it when it happened, and yes. I. Don't know that I had ever even heard of Pitney Bowes prior. It seems like an e-com logistics kind of thing, which is a little bit outside of my area of expertise. And so all of a sudden, everyone was talking about it for, for a week or two. And now nobody's talking yeah. about it anymore. But it got me thinking, what, what is Pitney Bowes? Why did this matter? Why did everybody care? You were talking about it too. So Close. yeah, I guess. So, um, so the question is, what is Pitney Bowes, and yes. why did why did people care so much about whatever? Okay, it is great. That they I'm gonna I'm gonna take it over for me now, and and we're gonna run with it. So, <clears throat> what is slash was Pitney Bowes? Uh, great question, Pitney Bowes. And for listeners, I will do my own rendition of a spelling bee. It's P I T N E Y. That's Pitney, and then Bowes, B O W E S, not Bowles. Bows. There's no L in there. I was putting the L in there several times, yes. I didn't want to call you out, Bill. Got, got it right for the podcast. I'll, I'll call myself out. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was uh, stupid. So, I can't call it a bowl. Yeah. So Pitney, <laughs> Pitney was, maybe is, a, a large player in the logistics space. They typically, you wouldn't know them. You would know some of their offshoots. You would know like the things that they call themselves. Um, so for a while, stamps.com, which you might be familiar with, yeah. was owned by Pitney Bowes. So when when they're like, oh, we can give you better rates on the postal on USPS shipping, it's because they were basically doing a lot of stuff themselves. They had negotiations with the post office. There's lots of like things. Pitney, Pitney as a company is, is very large. There's a lot of things they're doing. One of the things that they uh were doing that they they I'm trying to think of the right word for it. They like they let it let it die effectively. Uh, they they made it go bankrupt. Was Penny Pump Penny Bow's global e commerce and what that specifically was is part of their tra their transportation arm uh, where they would pick up from you. Uh, pay up your volume, move it across the country, and then inject it into the post offices. Now, now we will talk about a lot of that stuff, but that is that is what Pitney, the company, started winding down. Uh, and there's a round of layoffs as a result of that because it was effectively going under because it was winding down operations. Now, best guess at what happened is that they were unprofitable for a long enough time that they had to do something. And it, it was not, it wasn't worth continuing to put an effort to, to keep it alive. And so they wound it down. Uh, <clears throat> now, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of speculation as to why. And again, we still don't know the, the exact reasons why Pitney decided to, to, to sort of do away with the global e-commerce. Uh, but let me kind of explain what was actually happening um, I used to use Pitney, as I've made little to no uh, <laughs> secret of. Uh, so what would, what they would do, right, in a normal e-commerce environment, a customer places an order online, right, and then they hit, you know, order. And then a various host of software in the back end, which you're probably more familiar with, Bill, than I am, um, start acting. One of those things is a shipping platform. Again, I'm like skipping through several layers of software programs uh, here. And then 
what you would do is right. You would say, okay, I need to make a label for this package to ship to this customer. And you would make a label, right, potentially for the post office, and slap that label onto a box, and then Pitney Bowes would come and pick up that volume. So you would you would sort it uh, to them, and then they would pick it up, put it on a Pitney Bowes truck, take it to a Pitney Bowes uh, sorting facility somewhere local in, in a large region, uh, and then they would sort that out to the other distribution centers that they have across the U.S. And from there, uh, they would send it to a post office kind of sorting center. Now, the benefit for both companies in that is that Pitney Bowes was able to, assumedly, run a lot more efficiently than the post office was. And they're doing the legs of transportation, so the first mile and the middle mile, uh, that are typically more profitable and easier to run uh, than the last mile, which is the mile, what we call like the, the stop from the last sort center to your house. That is an extremely like unprofitable leg of logistics and transportation because you're having to make multiple stops. You're having to do, right? Like it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of manpower to, to deliver to someone's house. And so because the post office is not federally subsidized, but has been doing it so long, they really like own that space. They're able to do it reasonably well. What the post office would get, though, is that they could then focus more on the last mile and not have to deal as much with the first and middle mile. Uh, so it was a benefit for both companies. And then as a, a shipper, we would get the benefit of, of both of that and we would get lower rates. So you might, what, what, what I always refer to as like retail rates is like, what would I get if I just walked in and like slapped a stamp onto a package? That's a retail rate. What we would get, we would be able to negotiate with Pitney Bowes, we'd give them what our volumes would look like, and then they would return, like provide us better pricing against what you could get in the retail market. Uh, so from what I understand, uh, as I mentioned, they, they were running unprofitably for a while. A lot of reasons for that, mainly the pandemic and the shift to e-commerce purchasing um, flooded everyone's networks with volume. And a lot of carriers were actually having to turn away uh, some volume uh, for myriad reasons. A lot of things, they, they just couldn't sustain as much volume as they were getting. Uh, because of that, because of innovations in the space, uh, there were a lot of competitors that came up. They they were sort of around pre-pandemic, became more of a thing, became more competitive space post-pandemic. Uh, and so Pitney, in the like wake of that wave, had to do something to to remain a viable option and to stay competitive in that market. To do that, they cut rates, which obviously leads to, in a, in a commoditized environment, right, of just moving stuff, moving packages, which is extremely commodity-driven, uh, they had to cut rates. And that was it. Like, that was sort of the death knell of, like, when you have to cut rates past a certain point, you, you start to lose profitability. They lost enough profitability. Uh, people did either didn't come back to Pitney for whatever reason, or they did come back at super low rates. And Penny was just losing money, and they had to get wound down. So that's that is essentially what happened. Um, from what I understand, they went about it in a really not great way. A lot of people were just sort of didn't know what was really going on behind the scenes of the company, uh, and so it was it was a big kind of issue. So that's that's Penny. We could talk about like there will be a lot of, of waves that we will now have to ride out because Pitney was a was a very large, uh, you know, tentpole in the in the world of domestic transportation. It was, it was a big player in that game. Yeah, and so I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of implications to them. Just suddenly, it it, it was kind of sudden, right? They just yes, they just said, yeah. "Hey, we're not going to do this anymore." And all of a sudden, lots of people using them to 
Really, it's an interesting model too, because I'm used to thinking of shippers as right, as like UPS, FedEx, right, or even the yep. post office, right. The post office comes to my house, gets my mail, and brings it where I want it to go, right. Like, but but now, but and I had no idea that people would kind of integrate with the post office in that way, and maybe yeah. that I should have figured that out. But that's it's, and so. So, are other companies doing that same kind of integration? Have they jumped in, or is that very much exclusively a Pitney thing that? that they figured out. So that was not unique to Pitney. <clears throat> and there there were other companies that, that had a similar business model to Pitney's. Um, I won't name them, um, but there are companies that did it. Um, there are big companies that you named, UPS and FedEx, that had a service that was similar to what Pitney was doing. For UPS, it was called Mail Innovations. It still is called Mail Innovations. And FedEx has a thing called SurePost. Again, both of those are uh, postal injection models. So again, like a FedEx truck, UPS truck is going to pick up volume. Uh, and then at some point, you'll get handed over to the post office to get delivered. Again, super low pricing. It's like 50% of the price of a normal FedEx package or UPS package uh, with fewer fewer uh, surcharges <clears throat> that would apply to, to that shipping. The, the trade-off is that it takes a normal FedEx package or UPS package might take seven days end-to-end. -end. Typically, it's a lot faster than that, uh, but a similarly set package would take up to 14 days in those different environments. So it, it takes a lot longer to get your packages, but it's a lot cheaper. Again, it, there's a lot like the, the world of logistics, Bill, is, is exceptionally complex. Um, and and it is it is very interesting. So so yeah, like tip, like you said, normally uh, carry, there are carriers that that specialize in partial injection, which is a very specific like subset of e-commerce home delivery. And there are carriers that do everything themselves. So we said UPS, FedEx, um, regional players. Uh, there's a company called LSO here in Texas uh, <clears throat> that's branching out into the kind of middle space here in the the middle Southwest. Um, and then there's uh, the biggest player in the regional world is a place called OnTrack. Uh, they recently merged, uh, recently at post pandemic, merged with a company called LaserShip. So OnTrack was in the West Coast, LaserShip was on the East Coast in your world. Uh, they merged and now they're expanding into Chicago, into like Illinois and like Texas, because that's sort of where outside of the, 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 the coasts, that's where the rest of the population really sits is in like Texas along the Gulf Coast and then in, in Illinois. Uh, so that's that's all of those companies. They like soup to nuts, move your packages internally to their little ecosystem. Uh, but there's other carriers that do the same like Pitney Bowes type, type style of, of delivery. Uh, so they're so, so they're doing they're maybe doing pickups or they're kind of moving stuff in between the pickup location and the drop off location. I I keep just kind of asking myself like all these companies name on track I think I've heard of maybe a little yep. bit but but the others like not at all and yet they're moving packages around that presumably at some point I've either shipped or received and so I'm I'm oh, trying yeah. to just piece together like. Why Why have I never heard of these guys? It's because they're just in the middle and I'm still just seeing the post office and UPS and FedEx. Bill, I bet I I would bet a good amount of money that your company is currently moving volume through them. I, I, I would doubt it. In fact, that's probably, that's probably where I heard the name on track before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, and it, it, it really the rise of that competition was really because of the pandemic everyone kind of shifted and there was a lot of kind of simmering competition in that market um, that needed to find a way to kind of it just needed a spark to, to really break out and and boy howdy has it ever so we're we're still sort of riding the wave of, of trying to find like what the right carrier mix is uh, as e-commerce volumes revert to the mean uh, they haven't, you know, taken off, but they haven't they haven't declined. They've just sort of like come back down to where they would normally have been. Uh, a lot of reasons for that, but they uh, uh, there's been a lot of other competition in the market 
so yeah, that, that was more profitable. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a tough day, but yeah, Pitney Bowes moved something to the effect of 250 million packages per year, which is a lot of packages. It sounds like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and it so, like has so to go people, somewhere. So right. So and so it, it has to go somewhere. So what are what are people doing now? How did they? Uh, that sounds given the way that they did this again, as I sound, sounds pretty abrupt. Yeah. What did people? What did, I mean? In, 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 might be something that you yourself had to deal with. Uh, Thank you. Well, yeah. Okay, good, good. But yeah. so, what did? But I'm, I'm sure you've heard from others. Like, what are what do people have to do? Do they just have to scramble and find the nearest competitor to replace them? Which yeah. sounds kind of lousy. Uh, basically, yeah. So I've I've haven't I didn't have to deal with with this issue with Pitney. I don't use Pitney now. I have previously used them, <clears throat> and in a former life, I've had carriers that have gone under um it, and it is always abrupt it's always you know somewhat of a problem in the world of logistics we're typically used to having these types of issues um uh, and this these types of issues being like oh i can't use that carrier for that thing that i want them to do i have to find another way to to get packages delivered so that like happens all the time right it it, it could be as innocuous as Oh, someone like pulled the fire alarm at this sorting hub, or the fire marshal came and they said that we have too many cars in our parking lot. We can't, we cannot, we we can't process as many packages as we want to out of this facility. Those are super common, effectively like run of the mill problems that we deal with, uh, and typically like every holiday season from October until December. I expect to deal with at least one of those problems, if not multiple of them. Uh, so I've had carriers go under before. Again, it's always kind of a shock. It's a very much like we're running or running or running, and then we don't. We fall over. Uh, and so because they they have to keep making money until like the very end uh, for broad reasons. <clears throat> so what you would do in that situation is anything that you have in the pipeline for that company, right? Because of whatever processing you have in your warehouse, uh, you would keep, you would let it go if you could. Um, I know that Pitney said like, hey, as of this day, we're gonna stop receiving operations. As of this day, we'll stop delivering. There was about a two week window in there. Um, and so between those two events, and so you would, in the meantime, you would go find someone else to do whatever. Typically, uh, you have, Two different shipping options on your website. If you're in, if you're in an e-commerce environment, you have like your regular standard shipping, and then you have an upgraded expedited shipping. Most of the time, that expedited shipping is through UPS or FedEx. Uh, and when, all right, it's obviously an upcharge for the for the customer. And what you would do is look at what your existing network looks like and shift volume there, right? So you would discuss where I, with if I was with UPS, I would say, hey. You know, you know, you know that I work with Pitney. Uh, I need to shift volume. Can you take my volume? I wanna, I wanna have you know, mail innovations do my deliveries, etc. And so you would just shift that volume over. You would do your backend kind of software changes in your systems to move that volume over. Uh, and then you would probably go look for a, a new replacement to fill that in because we have found in the the transportation world on the shipper side, it's never good um, to be solely reliant on one carrier. Uh, you always want to have at least two, uh, just for like. That, that's that was going to be my exact next question, and you yeah. sort of answered it by saying it sounds like UPS or FedEx is kind of just like ever present, and and so you're there, so they're kind of the the backup. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They're they're very stable. They're very strong. Uh, you know they 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 remain profitable, uh, and they're able to weather a lot of storms for for myriad reasons because they're these huge corporations. Uh, and building a logistics company requires a lot of capital outlay. And so there's a there's a pretty big barrier to entry. And so because of that, like those two giants in the industry are really able to to sustain themselves. Um, and they offer a, a they offer a different service than everybody else does, right? So everyone may say like, "Hey, we're delivering one or two days." They're the only ones that are able to say, 
we'll do that nationally. We will do overnight delivery service nationally. Uh, no one else really does that. So because of that. So, so then they're, they're stable, they're big, they're, they're national. I mean, really, they're, 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 I assume they're, 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 yeah. they're, 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 right, they're global, mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, why, why do you need another carrier? Why can't it just be, right, why, why do all these smaller players exist? Why did Pitney exist at all if, if you've got these two giants? Dollar, dollar bills, y'all. Like, everything comes down to money. Uh, so UPS and FedEx have, have these large capital expenditures. They have, you know, massive sorting facilities. UPS, I've been, been to both of their, like, main hubs. Uh, UPS is in Louisville. Uh, FedEx is, is in Memphis. Uh, and they have spent billions of dollars on massive sortation systems. Uh, and the difference in service is the reason why they exist. Uh, again, you're able to ship in nationally to sometimes internationally next day. <clears throat> uh, but all of that infrastructure and service comes with a price, right? You have to pay more for that. UPS specifically has a very large uh, union. So their, their truckers are unionized. Their, I think their warehouse labor is also unionized. I'm not sure if it's the same union or not. I know that their trucking union is extremely uh, strong. So there's there's those types of large contracts that are that are injected into your pricing that has to get uh, you know paid for. Um, FedEx is similar. They don't have they have third party drivers that are contract drivers. So they they actually bid out their their last mile delivery legs are like subcontracted to to someone. So someone has said like, hey, I'll pay. I'll pay FedEx a million dollars and then they'll pay to like have the rights to this route. And then they'll pay me for every package that I deliver for them. It's like, it's a, it's an interesting and complex uh, delivery network for FedEx. But again, all of that pricing filters down to the customer. Uh, if you are using a different, like a regional carrier, you don't have as much infrastructure. They don't own planes, right? Like FedEx and UPS, they own a fleet of 747s and like huge aero buses that they have to like keep and maintain. FedEx and UPS effectively own their own airports uh, and they have like a lot of infrastructure. Regional carriers don't. Uh, I First time I ever walked into a regional carrier, like their sorting line was literally like a roller, like a sheet of rollers that they would like extend and they would sort off of a roller. Like that was it. And my, I had an intern at the time. She's like, wait, what? Like, this is how they do it. Like, it's cheap. It's efficient. Like, it gets the job done. Like, at some point, I don't care how the thing happens. I just care that it does happen. Uh, <clears throat> so anyways, but that's the, like, different. And they're able to provide a different kind of pricing uh, with hopefully similar service. The trade-off is the regionals don't go out of their region. So if you want a national carrier, you have to go with one of the bigger guys. Uh, there's a lot to it. It's a, it is such a complex web um, with a lot of like very changing variables. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we, we know supply chain is complex, like yes. across the board. Um, yes. I, I was just hearing about rolling blackouts in Mexico yesterday, um, which are obviously impacting us, they're impacting others too, but um, I have so many, so many variables. Um, so, but but now you're saying that your regional carrier um, can deliver more cheaply within a region. Yep. But but you, Crunchyroll, for instance, I assume ships nationally. So yeah. So are you just? Do you have like a network of regional carriers, or are you, or are you shipping? regionally using your regional carrier and then anything outside of their zone you just hand off I, to FedEx or, or you I can't? can't I can't tell you what my secret sauce is Bill. yes I'm sorry I All would right. love I would love to I I simply cannot um but would you have a a network of regional carriers yes potentially depends on how you want to set it up um I have worked at companies where I've had upwards of six different carriers in place at any given time. 
I was doing a lot of business at that point. I was moving something effective like 60 to 70 million parcels a year. I was moving. I was moving a lot of volume. And I needed I needed to have an, all of that. And I was effectively like maxing each one of those carriers out every year. So you could do that <clears throat> if you have enough volume. Typically, again, you'd have one to two different players uh, that meet some really specific needs. Uh, I've been at places where I, I really I was I was on the like bleeding edge of regional carriers being used for e-commerce. Um, at a company, I used one for like we had a, we were in Texas. We had a, a Texas was our major player. I was using LSO. Uh, we had about fifty one percent of our e-commerce business stayed inside of Texas, and so. I wanted to get as low of a rate as I could on that, like enduring existing volume. Our warehouse was centrally located here in Austin. Uh, so it was very easy for me to like hit all of Texas in one day from this location. I've had other times, times where I've had warehouses in multiple nodes across the US and I've had single nodes that are doing the entirety of the US. So there's, you kind of build a network around what you have and you, you try to build a dynamic um, network that is that is resilient while also being efficient, and and those are kind of the two competing priorities of like I want to get as low of a rate as I can, but I also have to keep volume moving. Uh, and so resilience is is important. We've learned a lot of lessons post pandemic. You can't be solely reliant on efficiency. There is some reason to have some higher rates in place because you just want to have a carrier around in case something happens because stuff happens. Got it. And I guess if you've got multiple warehouses across the country, then you can have multiple regional players and yep. then plug the gaps with, all right, with yep. the UPS, the big guys. Okay. Yeah. Software, software makes it all, makes the world go round. And so that, that shipping software is where you would make those types of changes. Uh, you, you would tell it, hey, this is the new price or, or I want to artificially lower the price in the system as you're like doing the rating uh, because I want to force volume to go one way rather than another. There's lots of levers that we pull uh, to get your packages delivered to you. And like at some point, there, there's always a point when you're in the e-commerce world where customer service and satisfaction matters a lot more than like your bottom line. And so there's a point, this is like the unknown world. Every year, right before the Christmas holiday season, like, like the last day, everything gets upgraded to next day air. Like we will ship every, we will like bombard the air network with packages so that you get your stuff on the day that you like have to have it. Yeah. Uh, and typically we foot the bill on that. It doesn't ever flow down to the customer. Uh, so it's it's an interesting like world to play in. Yeah, that that sounds familiar. Um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, Be I, I've had so many Lego things under my Christmas tree. So thank you, Bill, for getting I happy to oblige. It was all <laughs> it was all me. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. 20 years ago when I was still getting my ghost. <laughs> yeah, that was not me. Oh, cool. all right. Anything else that you want to know? We're, I know we're like, we're over our normal time. We, we, don't, we don't really have a normal time, do we? How no. I get pretty sure we've hit 40 minutes with every, every one of our recordings after, after agreeing that we wanted to do like a 20 to 30 minute podcast. I know this, this one felt important to kind of explain a lot because it, there's, there's so much more that I could tell you about like how, how, when you have a regional player and you're not in there, you don't start in the region. How do you get it to them? That's its own special world to like yeah. figure that out. Uh, yeah. You, you, you definitely, you definitely talked a lot today and I could see that you were, that you wanted to even talk more um, yes. evidenced by what you just said that apparently there's a whole other episode that we need to do. Maybe Pitney Bowes part two, where we talk about, <laughs> The handoff between regional players and uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, but next time it's going to be your turn to talk, Bill. It okay. will be my turn to talk. Yes. We'll try this. Awesome. All right. Well, cool. I thanks everyone for joining Something Something Pod Supply Chain Podcast. 
I'm really excited for our new naming and all of the marketing we're going to push behind this. I'm, I'm oh, yeah. stoked for it. Uh, speaking of marketing, we didn't, um, I don't think we mentioned our, our dear sponsor. Um, we didn't. A, a Amplifier. Them. Yes. Amplifier. Amplifier. Yes. Uh, you, you, you plug it. All I know is that it Amplifier and Macon Stokes are our friend. Macon Stokes Amplifier. and Amplifier. Yes. yes. Uh, Amplifier for all of your e-commerce fulfillment needs. Uh, they, I can confirm their, their logistics and transportation network is extremely resilient because Macon Stokes is a man of high intelligence uh and he he cares about having a network that continues to succeed and outperform others uh, so amplifier is great company highly recommended sad that we just plugged them at the very end of our joy bill didn't interrupt me uh when he should have so just having such always, a good time talking about about regional players and 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 pitney going under and you know like, injection. I, yeah. I, I just i couldn't i couldn't break in Literally, you were not giving me a chance. You literally did not give me a chance to interrupt. All right. Thanks so much, Bill. And thanks to our dozens of subscribers and listeners. We appreciate you. And thank you, Amplifier. We appreciate you for all of your support. Thanks, Matt.